Hello everyone, tis I, your dear Uncle Bob Bob. How's it going? You look well. Um, what follows is the live recording of um, our special Silly History of England Part 1. Because, spoilers, um, it turns out there's actually quite a lot of English history. So we got from the Romans up to Henry V. Um, there is some there is some nattering over it. There is some distractions. There is me glugging pop, um, which I'll try and take out. Um, but it's just a little present. It's just a little present um, to uh, to tide you over until the next one. So, um, yeah, it is what it is. It's not a proper episode. It's just a little present. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, enjoy the silly history of England. Thank you. I'll see you in two seconds. That'll be me. <laughs> me when I was younger and so full of hope. Come gather ye friends round your flickering microphones and listen to tales of daring, horror and high adventure from a small part of a small island. Uh, welcome, boys and girls, um, to uh, the silly history of England. I am your dear Uncle Bob Bob, uh, and I am here in the most English thing that I could bear to wear. <laughs> As those who listen to the show have worked out, um, I am a bit a Welshman. I'm quite unique. Uh, as Welsh people go, in that I was um, born in England, raised in England, and uh, have lived my entire life in England. So as a Welsh person, I am quite well connected to the country of England. Uh, and the other reason that you know, I'm not doing Welsh history is because Welsh history is enormously complicated. And as hard as I have tried to read up on it, I'm still not confident that I can riffle off a uh, very basic history of Wales. Wales will pop up in this as well because it lives next door to England. And you know what? England's like another people's countries. Anyway, that's enough of that. So what we are going to do is we're going to start at the Romans. So the Romans turn up in Britain twice. Once in roughly sort of 42 AD, Julius Caesar, who, as you may remember from episode 10, 11 and 12, uh, the seasoning, the Caesar trilogy, Caesar conquers Gaul, France. On his way round, he notices there's a, a little island in the top left hand corner, the northwest of France. Uh, and that island is, of course, Britain or Britannia, as the Romans called it. So Caesar pokes his head round the door. He um, knocks a few heads together, and then he pretty much leaves. But the Romans don't forget Britain for a number of reasons. First of all, even though the ancient Britons, as we call them, they, they didn't write all that much down. They just remembered it in a, in a way that I can't. So we don't know loads about Britain before the Romans because nobody wrote it down, basically. But they were... The Romans would have you believe that they were covered in mud and they ate mud and they walked around with their knuckles scraping along the floor and all the rest of it. And they painted themselves blue and, and did all sorts of wild and uncivilized things, which the Roman you'd never catch the Romans doing. But the Romans were their enemies, of course, and they wouldn't write anything nice about them. They wouldn't say what great metal workers they were. They wouldn't say anything about the incredible architectural achievement that is Stonehenge dragging blocks the size of a Volkswagen from North Wales all the way down to Wiltshire, which is a long way. It's a long way when you drive it in a car uh, with Mrs. Bob Bob um, in the blazing heat, which we did. So the Romans don't have an enormously strong opinion of the ancient Britons, but a couple of things happened. The fellow who leads Caesar's cavalry in the Gallic War retires to Britain, and he retires in some disgrace. So there's already a little bit of beef um, between the Britons and the Romans. Um, but what happens is um, there is a, uh, a British king who has a big sort of trade deal going with the Romans because Britain is actually a very rich country. We had loads of metal here, like Pear Bear would enjoy. Um, so it's a huge trade going all around the world from Britain, all the way to Greece, all the way to Spain. And the Romans, they want a piece of that. Um, so <clears throat> Emperor Claudius invades Britain. Um, they go along uh, the, Med the River Medway, uh, or the Meadway, 
Uh, that's where the River Medway gets its name because it was the river that all the mead went up and down. So it was a big trade place. Uh, and they um, and they conquered the country. Uh, they eventually find uh, found rather Londinium, which becomes the capital of uh, of Roman Britain. Uh, Chester. They also find out found Chester and Leicester and Colchester. So if you're knocking round Britain, anything that ends with an Esther is a Roman place name. It tends to be anyway. Um, the native Britons. The Romans are the Romans are a bit scared of the native Britons. It seems like because they they are a bit different first of all they're still using chariots which according to cassius dio have knives on the wheels and the britons ride up and down with these knives on their wheels which is you know get you six points on your license these days wouldn't it the other thing that the romans find quite scary about the britons is apparently the druids and um we don't know loads about the Druidic religion, and what we do know is what the Romans said. And this is a thing you'll find with history people. You cannot trust what they say about anything. Um, but the Druids, we know, does involve some level of human sacrifice. And the centre of the Druid religion in Britain is the island of Anglesey in the northwest of the country. So it's, it's right at the top of Wales, uh, and there's a little island in the northwest corner. Um, it's Anglesey. Isle of the English in English, um, Unus Mon or Mona in Welsh, um, which we'll which we'll get to. But anyway, the centre of the Druid religion is there, and the Romans, as they do, turn up, and um, in Cassius Dio, they say the Druids are so. Uh, Anglesey is an island, so there's the Menai Straits in between. When I was a young man, I steered a tall I steered a tall ship. Through the Menai Straits, one of the busiest uh, shipping lanes in the British Isles. But there you go. So, the Romans at low tide apparently are lined up on the other side of Anglesey there, and the Druids are there on the beach giving it beans. They've got skulls, they're shrieking curses. Apparently, the sky is black with lightning and things, and the Romans are terrified. Anyway, eventually, the Romans gather themselves and they go across the water. And um, I'm afraid they kill all the Druids. Uh, doubtless they had their reasons. They were Romans and they were very antisocial. Uh, so the Romans sack Anglesey, they burn all the groves, and they sort the Druids out from there. Now, while this is going on, uh, there is a rebellion down south in Britain, or the southeast of Britain, um, what's now East Anglia, where Pear Bear's from. Uh, and in East Anglia live a tribe called the Iceni. And the Iceni are a bit special. Um, most people in Britain at this point, um, they build great big hill forts, so big mounds of earth. Um, Maiden's Castle is a famous one. Um, but you'll see these Iron Age forts up and down Britain. But the Iceni don't do that. They live with horses. Uh, animals are their specialty. Uh, and basically what happens is... Um, to give, keep some level, to keep the Romans on side, the king of the Iceni has previously said, listen, when I die, I will leave my kingdom to my children and I'll leave it in part to Rome as well. So they pay him some sort of tribute. So the king of the Iceni dies. The Romans immediately go back on their, uh, back on their promise and um, they have his wife, who's a lady called Boudicca, some of you might know her as Bodicea. According to my horrible history book, that's a spelling mistake that somebody made, and the Victorians thought it sounded nicer. So that's where we get Bodicea from. Um, closer to her proper name is Boudicca, and I think most people know that by now. But anyway, they say to Boudicca, you can't have this land that is yours anymore. They have her whipped, uh, and they have her daughters uh, punished as well. And the Romans think that that will be the end of it, but it's not. Um, Boudicca isn't having any of this, so she raises a um, she raises a rebellion against the Romans, and they go and burn the living flip out of Colchester, which at this point is the capital of Roman Britain. Um, the Romans hurry back from Anglesey, and there is an almighty dust up on uh, in a place called Watling Street, which is the road that leads roughly sort of north. From London up to the north of the country. Um, and um, there is a battle on Watling Street. And that is where um, the Iceni and Boudicca 
are defeated by the mighty Roman army. Boudicca, um, she kills herself, apparently, rather than being taken alive. Um, and that is the last sort of big armed rising against the Romans in Britain. And Roman Britain becomes more or less pretty peaceful. They, the Romans carry on up south to um, what is now roughly the border of Scotland. And at one point, Emperor Hadrian decides, is right, this is enough now. We've got enough empire. We're going to stop here. Now, if, if you are of the Scottish persuasion and you think, aha, we add off the Romans, it's not quite true. There is another war called the Antonine War, which is further into Scotland. And there is a great battle between the Roman governor of Britain, Agricola, and um, the Picts, the picture people, because they wore tattoos and things. And those were the Celtic people who lived in Scotland at this point. So there is an almighty dust-up at Mons Grampius, which is a big mountain in Scotland. Uh, but the Romans, even though they defeat the Picts, they decide, right, we're staying there. They build Hadrian's Wall, uh, where me and Pear Bear have both been. Um, we got sunburnt through what felt like about 200 metres worth of cloud, but we did. I got the patterns of me Roman sandals burnt into me feet because I was dressed as a Roman. Anyway, some hundreds of years pass and the Britons decide they quite like the Romans. They bring central heating. Uh, they bring all sorts of lovely goods from all over the empire. And Britain sort of settles that because it's been a bit crazy. The whole place is a different section of tribes and, and peoples and little kingdoms who fight each other a fair bit. But when the Romans are in, it settles down a fair bit and becomes... Romanized. So we now move into the very early Dark Ages, or the early Dark Ages, or the very early medieval period, which is roughly 300 AD to 700 AD. Now, we've mentioned how unpleasant the Romans are. Yes, they build nice straight roads, uh, but they also get people to fight themselves to the death in the Colosseum. And they're pretty mean neighbours as well. And as a result, on the fringes of the Roman Empire, there's a lot of people who just don't like them all that much. And around this time, all Rome's chickens start coming home to roost. And uh, Rome itself is sacked a couple of times um, by the Goths, Vandals, VC Goths. And um, the Romans start pulling Roman soldiers out of Britain to defend Rome and the Empire itself. Um, dee 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 dee. And there is a letter that the, the Ro Britons write to the Romans and say, why are you going? Because when the Romans go, they leave Britain open um, to some other people from across the sea. Uh, and these people are mostly from northern Germany and Denmark. And you may know them as your friends and mine, the Angles and the Saxons. Now, what is their angle? Um, they live in northern Germany and there's a lot of them. And um, they feel like they don't have enough space. So they start coming over to Britain. And over many hundreds of years, they, uh, they push the native Britons, the Romanized native Britons, out to the other parts of the country. So they go west into the mountains. Uh, they go west into Cornwall. Uh, and there's also a fair bit going on up north as well. Um, it's known as the Old North, the British kingdoms at that point. So um, there, there are there's not much known about this because not many people wrote it down at the time. Um, but there's a good story. So it basically goes that um, the Picts in Scotland, so the um, the Celtic peoples up north, when the Romans leave, they start coming south and uh, with fire and sword. History people are awful. You know, you never hear about the ones who just sort of stay at home with their feet up, plow the field, maybe brew some mead. You never hear about that them. You, you hear about the um, the rascals who turn up with fire and sword. So the story goes that the Picts are raiding south into the Romanized bit of Britain, because Scotland, of course, is not Romanized. And um, it's a nightmare. And the Britons, living under the Romans, they've stopped painting themselves blue. They've taken the knives off the chariot so they can drive them more easily. And 
they're just not as good as fighting as they used to be. And the Roman army is gone. It's defending Rome. So the king of the Britons, Vortigern, sends for aid to North Germany. He invites two tough brothers, Hengst and Horsa, to Britain to help them out with the picks. And the Saxons, Hengst and Horsa, to be fair to them, they do, they do a good job. Do a good job. They push the picks back up to pick land, what will become Scotland. And everyone's happy. And Vortigern says, well done, boys. He has a reward. Here is some money. Here is some land. And the Saxons aren't happy with that. They want more. So they rebel against the Britons. Uh, and there is war between them. Um, eventually, Vortigern manages to bring them to the table, the negotiating table. So all the British chiefs and all the Saxons chief all sit round the table. And the Saxons murder the whole lot of them. They kill them all and they carry on conquering the west of Britain. Um, until um, And so Vortigern goes up to North Wales where he builds a great fortress at the top of a, a lake uh, and in the foothills of Ulfara Snowdon. And um, he's building a great big fortress and um, it won't stay up. It keeps falling down. So he goes to the goes to the druids who are still knocking round and he says what shall i do and they said well um the best thing to do is to sacrifice a child without a father and vortigern presumably shrugs and says what where am i going to get one of them from and the druids say ah there's one in the next village so this poor boy turns up he hasn't got a dad which is bad enough and uh, the romans <laughs> not the romans vortigern says right you'll be sacrificed on the morning and we'll build the castle the boy says, in that case, if I'm not getting sacrificed until the morning, can I dig a hole? And Vortigan goes, what? Well, knock yourself out. The day's your own. If you want to dig a hole, that's fine. I, I could think of better things to do on my last day on Earth. But the, the young boy digs a hole. And he digs a really big hole. He might be, he could be a bit special, this boy. He could be a magic boy. So he digs this great big hole and... Um, in the morning, they're like pretty impressed with this hole. And the boy says, come and have a look. So they go down into this hole. And at the bottom of this hole is this vast cavern. And in the cavern are two dragons beating hell out of each other. There's, there's two. There's a great big white one. And there's a pretty big red one, but it's smaller than the white one. And um, the boy says, there you go. That's why. The castle keeps falling down because of the dragons. And Vortigern goes, oh, right. Uh, any way we can get rid of them? And um, the boy opens a jar and the dragons get in. And he puts the lid on the jar and that's it. They can build the castle. But the boy says, you know, those were, in a way, metaphorical dragons. The big white dragon is the Saxons and the small red dragon is the Britons. And even though the white dragon is bigger and more powerful and stronger, the little red dragon is clever. The little red dragon has heart. The little red dragon became the symbol of the country that we all know and love <laughs> as Wales. So there we go. That's, that is the mythic history of what happened. That's not what happened. Probably over a few hundred years, the Saxons start turning up making war on these British kingdoms. And eventually, yes, it's true, um, the Saxon pushed the Britons into the western half of the country and Cornwall and up north as well. And the Saxons occupy what becomes known as England. But we, we will get to that because it's not England yet. It will be, but not yet. Um, they call the uh, native Britons, so they don't call them the Britons, they call them the Wheelhass, which means foreigner in the Saxon tongue. And eventually, Wheelhass gets corrupted into Wales. So, that is where the origin of Wales comes from. As a, as a word, that's where it comes from. Uh, and to use Wales as, you know, a country back then is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, the Welsh wouldn't have called Wales Wales. They had their own kingdoms, Gwynedd, Defford, Den Ibeth, all these little kingdoms, which at times fought against the Saxons, mostly <laughs> fought each other um, because there was no Welsh nation and we spent most of our time fighting each other. 
Anyway, so England. Right, let's have a little look back through some of these comments. I thought we'd have a little break here. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> oh my god uncle bob bob we're only half an hour in and we're still at the dark ages yes gloria um it's true um getting the money's worth there we go ah oh, thanks for of science could listen to it all day sandra braff yes it's me um and um i do prefer to be called your dear uncle bob bob but i forgive you sandra because i'm very grateful that you're watching uh, um d d d d s new zealand hey land of the long white cloud Go the Chiefs! Yes, Uncle Bob Bob. Watch his Super Rugby as well. Do do do. Sounds about right. Ba, ba, ba. Do do do. Dragons are so. You're right, Emma. You're right. And we will get to more dragons as we go. Excellent. Okay, so. We're all caught up with the comments. Comment as much as you want, and we'll, we'll stop at each era. I can't believe we're half an hour in and we're only at the Dark Ages. You're right. Okay, um, so one more thing about the Dark Ages while we're here. Um, this period when the Saxons are coming over the sea and fighting the Britons, this is where King Arthur is supposed to have existed. Um, he is our once and future king. He is recorded in many sources, written hundreds of years after the events that are supposed to have taken place. Um, he is um, attributed to 30 battles, some of which were 50 or 60 years in between. And so um, the long and the short of it is there isn't really a King Arthur as we know him. Not even the Bird of Cornwell, um, mythic Dark Age King Arthur. Who knows? He's probably eight or nine different blokes. Um, but if you think that, if, if you're wondering, was there a man with a round table called King Arthur? No. I'm afraid there wasn't. But that doesn't mean that he's not going to come back for you. England. This is our land, Saxon. All right, okay. Now we're on the late Dark Ages, Gloria. So, you know, that's 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 an improvement. Or early, early medieval. So we say 700 AD to 1066, the history year. Um, so, at this point, the Saxons get their feet under the table in Britain. Uh, and then it's and then it's time for get them to get a taste of their own medicine because from Scandinavia, a people from the far north of North Europe, a tough people, a hard people, a people that you know as the Vikings, um, their coming is prophesized by fiery dragons in the sky. They are um, a scary bunch. They turn up possibly for the famously for the first time in Lindisfarne. And the northeast of England, where Tom Fermor decided to go swimming in the sea once and nearly drowned. That's a story for another day. Uh, anyway, so the Vikings burned the monastery on Lindisfarne. And um, the Vikings wouldn't have called themselves the Vikings, although they would have known the word. So in the Scandinavian languages, Viking is a doing word, a verb. To go Viking means to go a-raiding on the high seas. Uh, you should probably call them the Norse, but Vikings is more fun. It's fine. So this happens for many years. The Vikings come raiding. They bring the stuff back home. You'll have seen a lot of it in the Vikings TV series with that very handsome man in. And um, eventually the Vikings decide, right, it's nice here. Yes, it rains, but it makes it very green. Uh, so the Vikings decide to stay and they form what becomes known as the Great Heathen Army. Uh, at this point, the Saxons have become Christian. And when the Romans were here, the Britons, the Welsh, became Christian as well. But the Vikings are not Christian. They are what Christian people would call pagans. They worship Thor, they worship Odin. And so the great heathen army is the great army of pagans. Uh, the, um, I've written some notes here and I cannot possibly read the word that I have just, um, just written. So the Vikings defeat in battle uh, Northumbria, East Anglia and Mercia, which are three of the four big kingdoms of England. So basically, all of England is now under Viking control. They are unable to finish off the last kingdom, which is where the Uther of Bedenburg gets its name from. The last kingdom is Wessex. So that's the last Saxon kingdom that's independent of the Vikings, and its king is King Alfred. Uh, now, Alfred, a pious man, uh, good Christian, uh, 
good soldier as well. Um, but not originally. He gets an absolute hiding from the Vikings. He has to go and hide in a swamp for a significant amount of time. And it's one of where the little stories about King Alfred, which, which many of you will have heard. It's not true, but it's quite a good story. Um, that's where the cakes comes from. So Alfred is covered in mud, hiding in the swamp from the Vikings. And um, in exchange for some shelter, uh, an old woman asks him to mind her cakes, which are cooking on the fire. And don't let them burn. And Alfred says, yes, I will do. I'm in disguise, just a guy down in his luck, hiding from the Vikings. The old woman goes off to, to bingo, whatever. She comes back. Alfred's been staring into space, thinking about, how am I going to get rid of the Vikings? And uh, he burns the cakes. And the old woman scolds him. And rather than say, listen, I'm actually King of Wessex, Mrs. Alfred says, sorry, to prove what a nice Christian man he is. Love thy neighbour. Alfred doesn't love his neighbours that much because over the next few years, he does eventually push the Vikings out of the edge of Wessex. He pushes them out of Mercia as well and um, is carried on. He saves um, the kingdom of Wessex, Alfred. And it is him who starts this idea that maybe all the Saxon kingdoms could live together one day. Um, the Vikings, meanwhile, they establish up in the north and the northeast of the country what they call the Dane law. So the Saxons called the Vikings the Danes. They assumed they were from Denmark. So Dane law is the Viking kingdoms in England. And Alfred's children, Ethelfled, his daughter, uh, and Edward the Elder, his son, and then, oh, blimey, I tell you what, put in the comments if you can remember the other lad's name because it slipped out of my head. Uh, I, in the notes, I just put Alfred's children. But Alfred's children, eventually, they conquer the Dane law and then they form, is it Ethelred? Ethelstan! <laughs> Alfred's grandson, Ethelstan, eventually unites the four kingdoms of Saxon England and that is where we get England from. Then the Vikings come back. There's a sequel. Uh, it's King Canute, who you may remember from episode one of the Silly History of Voice in the Harold Hadrard a bit. So King Canute conquers England. He kills poor old Ethelred the Unready, who is king. He's called the Unready not because he didn't uh, realise that the webcam wouldn't work on Safari uh, and had to use Google. Unready means poorly advised, unlucky almost. And poor old Ethelred the Unready is unready and he is unlucky because uh, he's dead at this point before he was dead he married a nice lady called emma of normandy remember that name because it will become important and basically this marriage to emma of normandy links england to a little bit of france in the north top everything happens in the top northwest in this story in the top northwest of france there is somewhere called the duchy of normandy and this will become a problem Let's go, let's go nuts. So, Normandy. You may know from the Song of Roland, one of our episodes, that Normandy means land of the Northmen. Because the Vikings didn't just go to England. They went to Ireland as well, but they went to France as well. And a Viking called Rollo, Ragnar Lothbrok's uh, brother Rollo in the Vikings TV series, he carves himself out a little bit of France. He actually makes so much trouble that the King of France is just... Just have that bit and go away, please. So Rollo says, okay, I'll have this bit. This will be Normandy, the land of the Northmen. So that is where the Duchy of Rollo is the first Duke of Normandy. Duke, incidentally, is a Roman title. It comes from ducks, anyway. Um, king Arthur's title was Dux Ballorum, Lord of Battle. So King Arthur was not a king, if he ever existed. Anyway, shut up. Over the next few years, uh, Canute dies, and then his sons die unexpectedly, and they leave poor old Emma of Normandy's only son, Edward the Confessor, to be king. Now, there's quite a bit in between here, but I realise, you know, we're already on 35 minutes, uh, and we are going to address it one day. So basically, the long and the short of it, King Edward the Confessor, King of England, does not have any children. Now, his mother is Emma of Normandy, and so... For various reasons, which we're not going to get into because we're running long, uh, Edward the Confessor was raised in Normandy. All his mates are Norman. He is, by all attempts, a Norman in England. 
He does his very best to sort of feel at home there. He uh, imports loads of loads of Normans to England and gives them positions of power. And this upsets one of the very powerful Saxon families who you will know as the Godwins. So there is a terrible scuffle between the Normans in the English court and the Saxons, the Godwins. Anyway, so apparently Edward the Confessor promises the throne of England to William of Normandy, his cousin. It's even possible that William visited England before all the stuff happens to get confirmed as this. Now, at some point, things change. Harold Godwinson, um, by defeating uh, Llewellyn ap Griffith, the King of the Welsh, the only man to ever be King of all of Wales, he defeats Llewellyn ap Griffith and does various good things for the English crown. And it is possible that Edward the Confessor says, Harold Godwinson, you can be king after me. But it doesn't really matter, and we don't really know, because then Edward the Confessor dies, and it all hits the fan. Um, the um, Duke William of Normandy says, right, I'm invading England. And also, the, the Vikings gag in on it, because um, King Canute was mates with King Magnus of Norway, and they had an agreement that um, if either of them died... Um, they um, they were each other's heirs. So if Magnus had died, then he would have um, been... Then Edward the Confessor would have been... No. Oh, my God. Right. So if... Don't worry. We can cut it. This is what this sort of thing is for. So if Magnus of Norway or King Canute had died, then they would be the heir to each other's kingdom. So Canute would have been king of Norway and... Magnus would have been king of England. It's complicated, but it's all Harold Hadrada from episode one of the Silly History Boys needs for an excuse to say, hey, I'll conquer England. I've got loads of friends. So um, there is an almighty dust up in 1066. But the long and the short of it is the Normans win at the Battle of Hastings. They eventually um, conquer the rest of the country. It's not as quick as it seems in on your school history book. But eventually, the Normans become kings of England. So the Vikings win in the end, which is what all the uh, programmes that like the Vikings like to put. Right, let's let's stop and go up the comments. Yes, so we've got a lot of love for Tom Thurmore in the sea. All right, okay, Morgana... Um, humble apologies, Gabriella. I can't go into the whole um, Arthurian myth because Arthur is Arthur is complicated. Um, large bits of it come from a very very old Welsh text written in the twelve hundreds, I think, called the Mabinagion. And Arthur is in it, and he's in other stories as well. But what happens is when the Normans uh, invade. Um, England, they eventually start having a go at Wales as well. And the story goes that because the Normans did not the Wel like the Welsh at all, um, but there was a, a Welsh writer called Geoffrey of Monmouth who was basically trying to make the Normans have a bit more respect for the Welsh. And he compiled all these stories of Arthur and said, Look, do you see how cool the Welsh used to be? And he's killing them all the time. That is a, a very, very basic answer to the Arthurian legends. Um, in, in short, Gabriel, we haven't got time to go into it. Right, let's go around. F already unready. The, the, the theater of Sussex. All it, it is all in the Anglo-Saxon chorus. But you're right. The A version, the D version, the F version is all there. D, 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 d. Why was he unready? He was poorly advised. Ha ha ha. Ducks. D, 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 d. Random. But yeah. Well, basically, theater of science. The idea is. Um, for this video to tie together the random bits of knowledge that we all have about various things. And for me to talk about Wales as often as possible. Right, oh, okay. Um, well, Emma, we I have not been to Battle Abbey. I really want to go. Uncle Bilbo's been loads, and he may as well go to Tesco. He doesn't care. <laughs> but I'd love to go to Battle Abbey and see it all. Tom's been as well. I think Pear Bear's been too. But I've never been, and I get all excited. All right, here we are, 1066, the history year. Um, so, 
What happens at the Battle of Hastings is that oh, the, a lot of Saxon noblemen die, which is very convenient for William because he's got loads of mates with him. And the only reason that they came is because William said, if you come, you can have a load of land because we um, in this country, we are led to believe because the Saxons lost that the Normans were all conquering, all powerful. You know, they were pretty tough as history people go. But it's not a foregone conclusion that the um, that the Normans will win the Battle of Hastings. It is a pretty close run thing. The only way that William can persuade anyone to go with him is to say, like, you can have land in England. So they do. And what the Normans do better than anyone is they build castles. Uh, you've probably read all about Mott and Bailey castles, but there is a big old system for them. So it's a big pile of earth with a fence around it. Uh, and then at the top, there's a big wooden tower, the keep. And castles are useful because you can basically keep your army safe in an unfriendly territory. Uh, and perhaps the most unfriendly territory, um, well, actually most of England is pretty unfriendly to the Normans. The Normans make the slight mistake of not executing everyone as soon as they arrive. Um, they prefer to um, pop your eyes out and chop bits off you rather than kill you. For whatever reason that is, maybe it leaves you as uh, an example not to be naughty anyway. Um, but the Normans probably should kill, <laughs> probably should have killed the rest of the Saxon aristocracy. I'm not saying that anyone should kill Saxons. That's not what I'm saying. Anyway, the Normans establish on the border of the Welsh kingdoms, which is what I'll call them, the March. Now, the March is um, a border, basically, and on the border... William puts his toughest, meanest, and most dangerous knights. And he basically says, you can stay there and you just can do whatever you want. He makes some negotiations with the people in, with the kingdom in South Wales. So South Wales gets left alone. But the Earl up in Chester, Earl, um, was it Hugh, Hugh the Gross of Chester, Hugh the Fat, it's very mean. Um, he can do whatever he likes in North Wales. So the Normans go flying into Wales, conquer huge parts of it. And the reason that Wales has got more castles than any other country in the world, per, per square mile anyway, is because elsewhere in England, you had to ask permission to build a castle. But if you were a marcher lord in Wales, you could do whatever you wanted. Now, stop talking about Wales, Uncle Bob Bob. Now, during William's reign, the north of England rebels. The north of England is up top, it's closer to all those Viking kingdoms. And England hasn't been a country for all that long. And the north of England, because there's been so many Vikings there for so many hundreds of years, it's quite different. So anything that ends with B-Y in England is a Viking settlement. Frank B, Whitby, these are Viking place names. Um, and they rebel against William. They even try and get the Vikings back again. So that bit in the Battle of Hastings where Tom says you kick the Vikings out of Britain, he could not be more wrong. They come back loads. Anyway, so William decides to sort the North out and he embarks on a campaign of cruel annihilation where he basically burns the North of England down to the root and apparently, I, I need to read this, but salts the earth so nothing will grow. And the North of England, some would say, are, is still in some ways recovering <laughs> from the sheer amount of people that William the Conqueror killed. William the Conqueror was a mean man. Um, he grew up tough, as you may know. Um, he was eight years old when he became Duke of Normandy, and everyone wanted to kill him. So, like the boy named Sue, he grew up tough and he grew up mean. But apparently the only thing that William was sorry for on his deathbed was the harrying of the North. Probably because he was worried that he was going to hell. Anyway, Billy dies, and he is succeeded by his son, William Rufus. Now, Rufus means red face. It may have come from his famous temper, red with anger. He may just have had acne. It doesn't really matter. He's not king for that long. He's not enormously effective. And he dies in a very suspicious hunting accident. He basically, um, he goes hunting with his mates and his younger brother next in line with the throne. And um, one of the best hunters there um, a renowned crossbow marksman accidentally shoots the king. And it's a terrible accident. 
Um, the Normans were big on assassinate. They might not have judicially killed people, but they were big on assassinations. They tried to poison Conan of Brittany's gloves. Filled his gloves with poison. Nightmare. Anyway, so Henry the First, William Rufus's brother, who was out hunting that day, becomes king of England. He's quite a good king. He's pretty good. He keeps the Welsh a few hidings. Uh, things now, because this is some years after 1066, and things are starting to get, you know, it's 20, 30 years, things are starting to get a little bit better. The Normans still have all the power, and the Normans still speak French as well. They live up in their castles, and they're in charge of the Surrey Saxons. So they still have all the power. Now, this is supposed to be brief, so be brief. Henry has two children. And his son dies in a shipwreck. He's next in line to the throne. He dies in a shipwreck. Uh, by this point, Henry's pretty old. Uh, and he's worried that he's too old to have more children. So he gets his lords together. And he asks them if they will swear that when he dies, will they make his daughter queen? This is obviously what informs the series House of the Dragon. This is where they got the idea from. So the lords all swear that they will let Matilda be queen when Henry dies. Henry dies. Half of them change their mind. They cannot stomach a woman to be king. Incels. Norman incels. Is that appropriate? I'm not sure it is. I'm very sorry. Um, yeah. So half of them support Matilda. The other half go over to France and uh, invite Stephen of Blois, which is a place in France. Come be king, Steve. You're a man. So there's a war. Uh, the Civil War is long and bloody. The Victorians, because the Victorians love history, they nicknamed it the Anarchy. Um, and basically, in the end, both sides punch each other out. And it is agreed that Matilda's son, Henry, will be king when Stephen dies. Then Stephen dies. And Henry, who's Duke of Normandy, uh, becomes Henry II. So England and Normandy are now linked together. When William the Conqueror died, he said, My son, dear uncle uh, Robert, Robert Curtos, um, which means Robert Short Trousers. William's first son was Robert Curtos, Robert Short Toes, who lives in a pineapple under the sea. Robert Curtos. One day. So, here's the thing. Henry II's dad is Jeff Plantagenet, Earl of Anjou, or Duke of Anjou. So if you've heard the name Plantagenet, this is where the Plantagenet starts. So we've finished Normans now, and we are now on the Angevins or the Plantagenets. And you will have heard of a lot of these. Okay. Is it time to go back for the comments? Maybe. No, I'll tell you what, I'm going to crack on this bit. And we'll do comments after the Angevins. Okay, so we've mentioned Henry II's dad, Geoffrey of Anjou, which is in France. His family name is Plantagenet. They're a big deal, this lot. Uh, they are going to rule England for a very long time. Uh, and like the Normans, they are French. Henry II, Duke of Normandy. Now, Henry is um, he's regarded, rightly or wrongly, as a very good king. Um, he certainly gets a lot done. He's a busy, busy boy. Apparently, he never gets off his horse. He's always riding back and forth all over the place. Uh, he builds lots of castles. He builds lots of churches. Um, so what I like about the Normans, they were good builders. Um, the Romans obviously built in stone, uh, and then you have that whole gap. The Normans built a lot of stuff, to be fair to them. Um, and the other thing about um, the other thing about Henry II is that he's not just king of England. He's also Duke of Normandy. He's also Duke of Anjou. He marries a very feisty lady. That's a bit patronising, isn't it? He marries a brilliant woman called Eleanor of Aquitaine. Uh, and she is Duchess of Aquitaine, which is basically the southeast of France. So Bordeaux and all that. Lovely weather, wine, troubadours. It's a very nice part of the world is Aquitaine. And Eleanor is uh, Duchess of that by herself. She's previously been married to king of france um but the king of france uh, was apparently how to put this directly more interested in praying than he was in his wife and they get divorced and she marries uh henry ii so henry ii is now duke of aquitaine as well 
by virtue of his wife. So he has the Angevin Empire, which is huge. He's got more of France than the King of France and England as well. Uh, so he's a good soldier, is Henry. He's a good administrator. Um, he also employs, as Tom will have told you, a man named Roland the Farter as his personal jester. Um, Roland the Farter lives in a nice house. He turns up at court once a year. He does a somersault. He farts. He goes home and he has a pension of some hundred pounds. It's nice work if you can get it, boys and girls. Well, that's Henry the Second's jester, Roland the Farter. There are, however, issues. Um, Henry does lots of reform particularly with the courts. Now, at this point in England, there are two courts. There's the church and there's the crown, the king. Now, if you commit a crime against the crown, you're crowned, you're charged in a crown court. Um, but you can argue to be charged in a church court. And the church really likes bribes. And the church also quite likes having power. And Henry II likes power as well. Um, so he wants this changed. And it's not easy because, of course, the church mates with God. And God is a big deal in history times. So Henry wants to stop this. Fortunately, he's got a good mate who is a priest. His name is Thomas Beckett, and he makes Thomas Beckett Archbishop of Canterbury, which is head of the Church of England. Unfortunately, making Thomas Beckett head of the English church makes him unexpectedly religious. And Beckett refuses to do all this stuff that Henry II has got him the job to do. Henry gets very cross and very frustrated. It is alleged, it's probably not true, but it is alleged that he shouted, Who will rid me of this turbulent priest? In earshot of three of his knights, who go to Canterbury and they hack Thomas Beckett to death in a church, which is bad at the time. Uh, not only that, um, I remember my uh, one of my many history teachers, but my favourite one, Mrs Jones, uh, told me that uh, one of the knights stepped on his head and uh, rubbed his brains on the floor. So there you go. Lasting impression, obviously. Dee, 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 dee. Um, so um, this is an enormous stank. A bishop is killed in a church. This is really bad in history times. It is so bad that Henry II, as a penance to say sorry, allows himself to be whipped through the streets of Canterbury. The king allows himself, this is such a big deal, that he allows himself to be whipped through the streets. He also has trouble with other stuff. Now, I mentioned um, Eleanor of Aquitaine, uh, Henry's wife. She's a brilliant woman. Um, she's probably be a very fine king. And she's not happy with the amount of power that she's got. And the trouble is, they've got a lot of sons. Uh, four sons. All those poor kings who couldn't have any sons later on. Henry II had four. Henry the Younger is the oldest. Then Geoffrey. Then Richard. And then John. Now, Henry makes the very odd decision of making Henry the Younger heir to the throne. Um, makes Henry the Younger joint king. Henry the Younger is king while Henry is still alive. Now, this is because of the anarchy. The anarchy was so bad before that Henry says, like, right, let's get this boxed off. I will be king. You're king as well. When I die, it'll be cool. Trouble is, Henry II doesn't die. Uh, he gives the rest of his lands to Richard and Jeff. He doesn't give anything to John for a long time. Um, even though John was allegedly his favourite, he doesn't give John any land for years. And he gets the nickname Lackland, which you may have heard in our live show, The Lion and the Weasel. Anyway, Henry the Younger doesn't really like being joint king. Because he's king, he doesn't have any land, he doesn't have any power, so he's kind of skint. Um, and next door, you've got the French. Uh, and they are sick of the King of England being King of France. So... Basically, they get in the ear of Henry's sons and they encourage them to rebel. And Henry the Younger, who's a bit of a prat, doesn't take much encouragement to rebel. There are several rebellions where Henry the Younger tries to overthrow Henry II. And then he poos himself to death. He contracts dysentery and dies. The next son, Geoffrey, he conveniently dies in a jousting accident. So no more rebelling from him. He's dead. The third son, Richard, is an issue because Richard is um, 
Even at the time, he is written of as like just basically like a medieval superhero. Richard Lionheart is a formidable guy. He becomes known as Richard the Lionheart. He rebels against his father with help from his mum. Richard was Eleanor's favourite. Uh, the rebellion fails. Henry and Richard make it up. But poor old Eleanor gets locked up in prison. And Henry never lets her out. Um, Henry gives Richard more land in France. But he rebels again anyway. And he basically gives his dad a nervous breakdown and he dies. So now Richard is king. He's crowned king of England. Richard I, Richard the Lionheart. Uh, and then he, he leaves the country pretty much immediately to go on crusade. We haven't mentioned crusades yet, but we will now. Um, so over in the near to Middle East is the holy city of Jerusalem. It's holy to Christians, to Jews uh, and to Muslims as well. And um, the Muslims have been in charge of Jerusalem for some hundreds of years. Um, but another thing has happened. The Byzantium Empire, who are what's left of the Romans. What happens, you remember earlier, 50 minutes ago, do you remember that? <laughs> the um, Roman Empire, when it's being attacked by people from different directions, says, right, this pl the whole place is too big to sort out by ourselves. So we're going to split it in two. The Western Roman Empire, which falls eventually, and the Eastern Roman Empire, which becomes known as the Byzantine Empire, because its capital is Byzantium, Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. Now, they have some trouble with the Turks. Uh, the Byzantians get thrown out of Turkey by the Turks. Wasn't we, We'll get into that later. And the Byzantians call for help to Western Europe, which is full of knights and things. And the Pope says, it is your duty to go and help these guys, uh, to go and help the Byzantines the Byzantiums, because you all keep fighting each other. You're all supposed to be Christians. You're supposed to love your neighbour and do good to those that hate you. And none of you do it. Um, and frankly, you're all going to hell. Unless you go and get Jerusalem off the Muslims. Now, this is about 100 years beforehand. And remarkably, the First Crusade succeeds against all the odds and they capture Jerusalem from the Muslims. Then the Muslims, led by Saladin, Saladin um, take Jerusalem back. And so there is a second crusade, and a third crusade to get Jerusalem back. And Richard the Lionheart and his neighbour, the King of France, King Philip of France, they agree that they will go on crusade together. Um, so Richard goes over to the Holy Land. It's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, there, there is an enormous siege come battle uh, at a place called Acre or Acre. And um, eventually the crusaders take Acre. So they now have a port to go and... Um, take Jerusalem. At this point King Philip says, right, take an acre now, uh, I'm off back to France to go and get your land. Richard though goes like, right, I'm here now, let's get Jerusalem back. Um, it's a bit of a mixed bag. He defeats Salah at the Battle of Asuf on the way to Jerusalem. Um, according to a big thick book I read on the Crusades, um, Richard was like, let's not get Jerusalem, let's go and conquer Egypt where Salah Hadin gets all his men and money from. But the Crusaders were like, no, we've come all this way. We've got to go to Jerusalem. And it doesn't work. Uh, they can't get there. It's, it rains loads, weirdly, for a desert. It rains a lot. And eventually there is a truce between Salah Hadin and Richard because Philip of France has gone back to France and he is attacking Richard's lands. Uh, not only this, is he has persuaded his little brother John who is looking after England while he's gone, that he will be king of England if he sides with Philip of France. So Richard has to go back. He um, he beats the French. He gets hold of John and he forgives him. Um, he says that um, he was a child counseled by evil men. John was 23. There we go. Anyway, Richard now has to go and get his land back off the French. He does this. And at a small castle in the south of France called chalot Shalushabra, Richard walks into a crossbow bolt, which goes septic, and he dies. The lion heart, uh, the lion is killed by an ant, which is recorded in the chronicles, and thus the lion was killed by the ant, which is the last line of our show about it. So, he's dead. John is now king. Uh, John is traditionally known as England's worst king. Um, 
although he did found Liverpool in 1207. So there we go. And that is where we are recording this from. Um, blimey, there's... Uh, I'm, after King John, we'll do questions. Uh, so th there are many reasons why John didn't work out as a king. First of all, all the circumstances. Um, I forgot to mention that on the way back from Crusade, Richard the Lionheart was captured by the Duke of Austria and they had to ransom him. This is where we get the expression a king's ransom from. A ransom was if you captured a knight or a noble or a lord in order to get them back because you've seen the trouble it causes when people don't have their heirs, to get them back you'd have to pay them a lot of money. A king's ransom is a lot of money. Uh, they've already raised taxes in England to pay for the crusade which was expensive. Now they've got to raise taxes even more. They've got to lean on the church, something fierce. And basically, everyone in England is now angry with the royal family, the lords, the knights, the peasants, the church. So John inherits this problem. He's also just a jerk. Um, he's rude. He's arrogant. He offends people um, more times than he's had hot dinners. He makes enemies wherever he goes. He continues Richard's war against the French, uh, but he loses. Uh, and the French take all his father's land, all that masses of France, Aquitaine, um, Normandy. The only thing that is left is Garcony and Calais. I think it's Calais. No, that's the Hundred Years' War. There's only a tiny bit of English land left in France now, which is Garcony. Uh, and King John has lost the whole thing. People are not happy about this. Um, the barons of England, some of them have land in France, and so they either have to give this land up or go and be French. Um, the country is also sick of the taxes it's paid. And um, eventually, so things are not good between King John and the barons, and eventually they fall out so much that the barons write the Magna Carta, the Great Charter. It's a complicated document, but the, basically the purpose of it is to curtail, the, to make the king less powerful and um, answer to a council of barons called parliament there we go king john signs the Monte magna carta and then hires an army of mercenaries to kill his barons there is another civil war um and the barons invite the french to invade and come and be kings of england uh, the french do um stressed out king john eats too many peaches and drinks too much cider and poos himself to death. So there we go. We arrive at King John. Okay. Question time. Sorry. I didn't realize this was going to be as long as this. I should really have known. Mutton and beef from Dunstan Mountain. There we go. Question number three. Yes. Shakula, that is indeed correct. Tom told me that. So it must be right. Bad only at the time. Uh, hacking to death in a church is bad at times. Yes, all right. Hacking someone to death in a church is also bad. <laughs> all right. <laughs> it's particularly bad. It's bad enough to get yourself whipped through the streets. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh, no. The legend of why halves have red beaks and beaks. Ooh. Thanks, Elizabeth Dennis. That I've never heard that before. Thank you very much, Bryn. It's a tidy name, son. Right. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Guy's very knowledgeable. I like him. Thanks, Tom. I love you too. I'm drinking Dr. Pepper. This is my little treat. This is my little treat. I thought I was going to talk for an hour about history. Um, how did King John invent Liverpool? Very, very briefly. Um, King John invented Liverpool, which was a sleepy fishing village by the sea in the northwest of England. Um, it's next to Ireland. Now, you remember the Marcher Lords in Wales? The Normans did something very similar in Ireland. A load of Norman knights went, there's not enough Wales, there's not enough England, let's go over here. And so it's not the English that originally invade Ireland, it is the Normans by themselves. And they eventually start carving themselves out quite a bit of land. John's lost France, so he goes, ah! Oh, this island you guys have land in england you owe me homage and money so king john needs a new port to wish to do all this irish fighting and he picks in 1207 liverpool to be his new port to invade ireland from 
Liverpool, if you are interested, comes from the Anglo-Saxon lava, seaweed. The natural harbour of Liverpool was full of weeds. So lava pool becomes lava pool and um, produces uh, the best band and football team there is. Led Zeppelin and 70s Brazil, Uncle Bob Bob. Never mind. So, King John's dead. We move on to Henry III. Incidentally, uh, we're probably going to stop at Wars of the Roses, Battle of Bosworth, I reckon. Because otherwise, I'm going to be here all night. It's fine. Henry II, uh, Henry III. He's only a kid where, when John dies. But that's pretty good because all the barons hated John. They didn't hate the kings of England necessarily. They just hated John. So when John dies, they're like, yeah, we don't need the French here anymore. And um, the French are defeated in the Battle of Lincoln. And the French go home. And Henry becomes Henry III. And it all calms down for a little bit. It all calms down, which is good. Uh, Henry is a very religious king. Uh, and he seems he seems like quite a gentle soul, Henry III. Um, and he's possibly too kind to some of his wife's relatives who have lost their land in France. And he gives them special favours, and this upsets the barons of England, who frankly are very easily upset. Uh, in their upset state, the barons remember the Magna Carta, and they say that the king is going against Magna Carta by not being nice as nice to them as he is to these people from over the sea. So they forced Henry to sign the Accords of Oxford, which is the Magna Carta sequel. Neither side's happy, so they have a war. Now, the barons pick a lad called Simon de Montfort to lead them, and he's pretty good. He's pretty tidy, Simon de Montfort. Uh, he gives the king's army an absolute kicking at the Battle of Luz. He locks up King Henry, and he locks up his son, King uh, Prince Edward, as well. And now Simon de Montfort and Parliament rule England instead. Until little Prince Edward escapes. Um, he uh, rescues King, Ar King Henry and he raises a great big army. And he defeats Simon de Montfort at the Battle of Evesham. Now, the Battle of Evesham is a messy old battle. Um, in the Chronicles it says, um, what is it? Nay, call it the slaughter of Evesham for battle. It was none. Because the king and Edward need rid of Simon de Montford and his family. So rather than ransom them, they straight up kill them, um, which is rare for the time. So Henry III eventually dies, and his son, Edward I, Edward Longshanks, the Longshanks, becomes king. Um, six foot two, which is tall for medieval times. Um, Edward loved war, taxes, and his wife. Um, yeah, um... And basically, Edward starts out making sure that the royal authority is never challenged again. Um, in part, he he realises that a very good way to do this is a big war. Now, next door to England is the best country. Uh, or rather, the kingdom of Gwynedd, like Gwynedd Paltrow. Gwynedd in North Wales is the last independent kingdom of Wales. And basically, all these civil wars I've mentioned, the anarchy, all these various rebellions, whenever England has a civil war, the Welsh start taking a bit of Wales back. And indeed, the Welsh did help Simon the Montford and the Barons. In fact, Clewellyn, Prince of Gwynedd, marries um, Simon de Montford's daughter. And Edward doesn't like this. Um, the Welsh sent troops to help the barons out, um, and um, Edward's not happy. So he demands that uh, Llewellyn um, swear loyalty to him as his overlord. He does this several times, and he does it once in the middle of winter. And for whatever reason, Llewellyn doesn't turn up. Some people say he couldn't get there in time. Some people say his wife had just had a baby. Some people say he was just like, no, nah, all right, if, 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 if you want to fight about it, let's have a fight about it. They do. Um, Edward invades Gwynedd once, twice uh, and that is enough uh, to finish off the last independent kingdom of the Welsh and um, yeah, uh, Clewellyn the last Clewellyn Ap Griffith is uh, murdered on the way back from church which was bad at the time, you know really bad um, and um, Edward rings North Wales with even more castles, he spends tons and tons of money and if you go particularly to north wales they have some banging castles because 
Edward had decided the Welsh are going to give us no more trouble ever again. We do. Anyway. <clears throat> then something up north happens. We haven't really mentioned Scotland uh, in this little story of England. Um, but they now become significant because Alexander II of Scotland gets drunk and rides his horse off a cliff. I kid you not. That's how he dies. Um, and the Scots down south is this great big kingdom, England. They get Edward in to the King Edward of England. They get him in to decide who is going to be King of Scotland. So Edward picks one of his mates, John Balliol, to be King of Scotland. And all the Scottish nobles who aren't King, i.e. the Bruce family, Robert de Bruce, um, they're not happy about it. So they rebel against King John Balliol. And John Balliol calls on Edward for help. And Edward goes medieval on Scotland. He burns huge swathes of it and he is generally very unpleasant. Um, it does not take much to put the Scots back up. Uh, and two Scottish knights called Andy Murray, Andrew Murray, go on Andy! Um, and William Wallace rebel against John Balliol and his English mates. Uh, they defeat the English army at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, which is the first battle in Braveheart. And as you may have noticed, there is no bridge in that battle. Um, Andy Murray's killed at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, so it's William Wallace by himself. Um, Edward himself, who was not present at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, then comes back up north and gives the Scots a proper hiding at the Battle of Falkirk. Um, oh no, Andy Murray dies at the Battle of Falkirk, sorry. William Wallace now goes on the run. Um, the Scots eventually sell Wallace to England, and they have him hung, drawn and quartered. Uh, and Edward I is pretty old by this point, and at this point, this is a sad bit. They were people. Um, a great tragedy befalls him. His wife dies. Uh, and Edward loved his wife very dearly. And he places crosses up and down the country to her memory. And the most famous of these crosses is Charing Cross in London. Um, now, the Scots up, rise up again, led by Robert Bruce and Edward. And they give him another hiding. Scots rise up, led by Robert the Bruce, and Edward gives them another hiding. Uh, and then he dies uh, after a good innings. There we go. He's about 60 old when he dies, Edward. Maybe a bit older than that. All right. Okay. So let's have a little rumble back through the questions. Ba -ba -ba -ba. I agree he's regarding Liverpool football team. In that order, yes. War taxes and my wife punches kitten. Yeah, it's true. Um, what do we think, boys and girls? Shall I, shall I carry on? Um, we've been here been here an hour and 13, and we've still got... Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. We've still got Edward III, Edward II, Richard II, Henry IV, Henry V, and then we get towards the Roses. I, I tell you what, I'm going to do till Henry V, and then we'll do some questions. And hey, let's meet back up and do this again because I'm sure you've all got lives to go to. And um, frankly, this is more than enough for an episode. <laughs> right? And indeed, oh. So, Eb the First is dead. He loved his wife. Um, I wouldn't we on him if he was on fire. Right. Okay. There we go. Edward the First dies. He is succeeded by Edward the Second, who was tall handsome and apparently enjoyed talking to peasants which was frowned upon at the time so it's fairly safe to say he spoke english as well as french because at this point they are all still speaking french now i read up on edward ii and his reign is pretty complicated it's enormously interesting and i would like to read more about it uh, so i will but on my own time but once again he falls out with his barons he also falls out with his wife who is a lady called isabella and she's from france it's um, Sophie Fingy in Braveheart. This is her. Um, he also loses the Battle of Bannockburn against Robert the Bruce, who becomes King of Scotland. And now Scotland is it complete, more or less out of England's... No, that's inaccurate. I'm going to shut up about that. So anyway, he loses the Battle of Bannockburn to Robert the Bruce. Uh, Edward II had a friend. His name was Piers Gravison. And his barons didn't like Piers Gravison because Piers Gravison wasn't them. And he was good mates, and he gave Piers Gravison great favour. Now, um, it is possible that he was gay. 
Um, but it is equally possible um, that his enemies just made up this fact uh, and suggested that Piers Graveson and Edward II uh, were lovers. Um, and this is actually what, unfortunately, history people are not very nice. This is what medieval people did to discredit their enemies. Uh, they made stuff about them. There we go. We've moved on. Things are better now. The long and the short of it is he argues with his barons and he is forced to step down as king by his own queen, Queen Isabella, and her new lover, Roger Mortimer. Ow! Ow! So there we go. Um, it is agreed that his son Edward, another Edward, will be king after him, and then he's quietly murdered. Uh, there is a famous history story that he got a hot poker up the bum. It's probably not true. Uh, it was more than likely made up after the time, which is just as well, because it's Nasty way to go. Isabella, the queen, and Roger Mortimer, her lover, rule the country for a little bit. And then little Edward, furious at his dad's murder, overthrows them and has Roger Mortimer brutally executed so hard that he dies from it. We now move on to Edward III. Um, during Edward's reign, the king of France died without any children. Uh, the French elected a new king, and started a new royal line. But Edward had been related to the previous French king via his mother, Isabella, who was from France, remember? So he has an idea. Maybe he could be king of England and France as well. And thus begins the Hundred Years' War. England invades France to serve him right for 1066. Um, it's not a straight hundred years of fighting. Um, it's actually 116 years of small, medium, and big wars between the English and the French and the Burgundians and the Garcony, Garsons, and it all gets very complicated. Um, the French, at the start, they might even have accepted Edward as their king, but he burns and loots so much of the country that the French take it personally. Um, Edward is famous um, for his many victories over the French um, through combination of longbows, smooth generalship, and the French being... Pretty useless at the start of the Hundred Years' War. Um, Edward beats them at the Battle of Cressy. Uh, and um, listen, I know we, we, we're running over, but I'm doing it. Edward III had a son called Edward. He was known as the Black Prince, possibly because of his uh, black armour, possibly because of his fearsome reputation. He was uh, a massacre type. Um as a 16-year-old boy, he is in the middle of Edward's army at the Battle of Cressy. Uh, wiping fools out. Um, the, the, the hardest press of the French is, is going towards Edward the Black Prince. And um, someone says to King Edward III, just help the lad out, maybe. He seems to be struggling. And Edward III apparently says, let my son win his spurs, which is a very medieval thing to say. Amongst these French knights trying to kill the Black Prince is King John of Bohemia who's a long way from home Bohemia is where the Czech Republic is now more or less, or Czechoslovakia anyway he's blind um, he has a degenerative eye condition which makes him go blind but he's still there he's, um, he's helping out the King of France, his friend he's still there, he's got two pals with him tied to either side of him and he, ride, he says to them Bob and Tom, ride me into the thickest press of the English army. And they presumably go, what? Why? Anyway, they have to do what he says because he's king. He goes flying in there and at some point he is killed. Edward, the Brack Prince, um, heir to the throne of England, is enormously impressed. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned is that after Edward I, henceforth, the heir to the throne of England it becomes Prince of Wales. He replaces uh, Llewellyn the Last as Prince of Wales. And so to be Prince of Wales is to be training to be the King of England. So Edward the Black Prince is enormously impressed with King John of Bohemia's bravery. And so he takes his personal symbol, the three feathers and his motto, Ich dien, in Latin, I serve. And this still sits on the front of the greatest rugby team ever to have played the game, and indeed the best country. Um, so that's why the Prince of Wales is feathers, and Ich Dien is the symbol of the Prince of Wales, and 
That's why it is on the jersey of the Welsh Rugby Union. Right, there we are. That's more Wales that we didn't need, but we're here now. Okay. So, Balacressi. Um Edward rules for 50 years. That's not bad at all. Um, his wars in France help him form a close relationship with his barons who grow rich robbing the French. And they really like him. Um, King Edward III loves stories of King Arthur and he wants his own round table. He is possibly one of the first English kings, although his dad did as well, to speak... Oh no, one of the first English kings to speak English as his first language, which is significant. Now, here's an unfortunate thing. Edward, the Black Prince, dies before his father. And his father has no other sons. And this causes a lot of uncertainty when Edward III dies about who is going to be king. And this is going to cause an awful lot of trouble later. We then get to Richard II, who is Edward III's grandson. Um, it is decided that um, a direct line to um, the heir to the throne will be king. Richard's only 10 when he comes to the throne. His claim is a little bit shaky. Um, Edward III had some other sons as well. One of them being John of Gaunt, who's Earl of Lancaster, and the other being Edwin, Duke, Edwin Langley, Duke of York. York, Lancaster. Remember this, it's going to be a problem. This is also another problem, is the Black Death. This is the time of the first Great Plague, which kills millions across Europe, especially everyday peasants like you and me. Now, now that there are less presents, uh, less peasants present, peasants have more value. Maybe they'd like some better wages. Maybe they'd like some fairer treatment. Maybe if they're sick of their lord's nonsense, they'll pack up and leave and work for someone else. And this is a problem. So Richard II passes a law against it. And these laws are a problem for the people. The people don't like them. So the peasants are whipped up by former soldier Watt Tyler and crazy mad priest John Ball and they march on London and demand fair treatment. The king and his knights meet Watt Tyler and the peasant army at Smithfield outside of London. No one knows what happens exactly or why, but what happens is this. Watt Tyler rides up to meet the young king and William Woolworth, mayor of London, stabs Watt Tyler to death. No one knows why, um, but the army of peasants go nuts. Um, they all start drawing longbows. They start shaking their pitchforks. King Richard, some stones on him, man. He rides up to the front of the parent horde and he appeals for calm. He says something like, I am your king. I am your captain. Have peace. Or something similar anyway. And to be fair to the posh boy, he talks them down. He lies through his teeth and tells them that all their grievances will be settled if they go home. And because he's king, anointed by God himself, they believe him. The peasants disperse and they go home. And once the mob is broken up, the royal authorities round them all up in their thousands and hang them. And the people never forgive the king for this. And who can blame them? More significantly, um, the events of Smithfield give Richard a bit of a god complex. He becomes very, very difficult, very arrogant. There's some people who say he might have been uh, neurodiverse. Who knows? But it's impossible to say. He, he was told that he was God's representative on Earth, so he's bound to play up. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, he upsets the nobility, which you must never do. So Henry Bolingbroke, son of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, remember him, he overthrows the king and he locks him up. Um, he's going to let him live originally, but people keep trying to break him out. So he very quietly starves him to death. Henry III is ages ago. Henry IV is now. And easy lies the head that wears the crown. Henry and Richard II had been childhood friends. They found themselves on different sides of arguments about land and power. And replacing Richard was not a popular decision. And rebellions break out across England and beyond. In 1400, wearied by squabbles with his English neighbours and incensed by unfair laws, Owen Glendur rebels and crowns himself Prince of Wales. And in the north of the country, the ambitious Percy family joined the Welsh in a rebellion against Henry IV. Both rebellions are ultimately defeated. But the hassle takes its toll on Henry, who may even have had leprosy. Whatever the case, 
he dies. His uh, son, Henry V, is young, handsome, paragon of English virtue, and he replaces him. This is Shakespeare's version of Henry V. Um, it fails to mention that he had a dirty big hole in his face because um, he got shot in the face at the Battle of Shrewsbury fighting um, Percy and I think Welsh rebels as well. I hope so anyway. Probably a Welsh bowman who got him. <laughs> we'll do that one day. Anyway, once crowned king, Henry V makes a big effort to smooth over all the trouble with the various um, rebels. Everyone is pardoned. We're all friends here, apart from the French. Because during um, Henry's reign, the King of France um, has given assistance to um, O England do his rebellion. Uh, and Henry also has the claim to the great, 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 great grandfather's claim to the throne. So it's war again. Henry invades France. He gives them an almighty historic hiding at the Battle of Agincourt. He captures Paris. He conquers huge bits of France. And it is agreed that he will be king of France when the incumbent French king dies. He marries uh, French princess Catherine of Valbois. And then I think at the age of 36, he dies. The last thing we'll mention before questions is that uh, Catherine of Valbois, presumably very sad at losing her husband, remarries a young gentleman, a Welshman by the name of Edmund Tudor. So we'll leave that hanging. Blimey, an hour and 26 minutes about history. I literally thought we'd be here about 45 minutes. Anyway, let's do let's do questions. I, I appreciate lots of you have got homes to go to. So that's OK. Right. Any questions? I've seen a Shakespeare play about this, except not enough, <laughs> not enough men auditioned, so it was Joan of Gaunt. Hey, why not, man? <laughs> I um, met a nice man once uh, who had written a book called When Adam Delved and Eve Span, Who Was Then the Gentleman? Which is what, apparently, the, um, the strolling priests used to preach against um why have we got an ability why have we got these people in charge of us um the only people the person who should be in charge of us is god ba -ba -ba -ba. right there we go yeah so um he wanted someone to write a play about the peasants revolt which is what we've just discussed and i was like that sounds great but history's a lot of work <laughs> it is a lot of work isn't it Right, okay, so we have gone from the Romans to Henry V uh, in our history of England. Just f to think that I read up on the English Civil War today just in case uh, we went nuts and carried on. But listen, we've still got plenty of people. Oh, Mortal Monarchs. I've not got that. Thank you for that. I'm watching with my daughter who's home educated and this was her history lesson today. Katie, you are very, very welcome. Um, sadly, I know no children who want any help with their history homework, um, which is um, which is a shame because, as you can see, I've, I'd be useful, man. I could I could do a job. <laughs> anyway, righto. Thanks, Ems. That's very very kind of you. Um, yes, we'll we'll leave it on that, Lynn. I didn't realise it'd be so long. Blah blah blah. Right. Yeah, horrible histories is really good. It's probably the best um, sketch show knocking around on telly in the last five or six years or so. Uh, and I'll tell you something else as well. You know, the, the books, I guess, have some information which is a little bit out of date or maybe not quite right. But they, they do an extremely good job of making it all succinct and putting all the gory bits in there. I kind of think that part of the job of the Silly History Boys is to do... Some of this, because we're always finding stuff out about the past. Um, and sometimes, you know, the Victorians pick the more exciting story about over what happened. But I think there's always there's always space for stories. And history, after all, is is about stories. Otherwise, people wouldn't be interested in it, I don't think. Um, but listen, you must have been interested in it. Um, thank you so much uh, for watching. If anyone else, uh, if there are no further questions. Hello, Clay. Welcome. Uh, I'm just about to go. Um, yeah. So listen, we'll pick this up another day. We will go from Henry V. Oh, blimey, how far should we go from there? I mean, I suppose, we, you know, we've, we've covered 
we've covered a good um nearly a thousand years something like that nearly a thousand years of history in an hour and a half ba -ba -ba -ba. corpse talk um bank glory i'll definitely have a little look at that i've not heard of them before um, but thank you very much. Cheers for that, Joey and um, and, and Laurie. Um, listen, everyone, thank you so much for watching. It's been really nice. Mrs. Bob Bob's at Glastonbury, so I'm a bit lonely. Um, so that's been really great. I'm going to go because I'm, I'm sure you've all got stuff to do. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm going to have my other little bottle of treat. Uh, thank you so much. And um, for all the talking, nattering, and little side quests that we didn't mean to go into, but did, um, we are, as always, sorry. <laughs>